Welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, the April edition of uh, Flower Monthly. It's wonderful to see so many people joining us uh, today. Um, we have got a jam-packed Flower Monthly um, to show you today. Uh, we've got a number of uh, speakers, got to make very exciting um, different types of announcements and, and different types of uh, components and things to discuss with you. Um, so with that, uh, let's kick things off. I wanted to begin um, by reminding um, those of you who have, haven't attended to a, a Flower Monthly before um, uh, as to why we're here and what the purpose of Flower Monthly is. Uh, Flower Monthly is an annual, uh, a monthly event that we started a, a few months ago um, where we uh, hosted on the first Wednesday um, of each month. It uh, seeks to be a, a regular and formal um, venue for us to share with you updates about flower, for us to invite people making contributions to flower to hear from, um, and to generally uh, look for advancements in the area of federated learning and how it pertains to the flower community. Um, we, uh, we invite uh, different speakers who also might give tutorials, how to, or even present pieces of research. Um, you're gonna hear things like uh, framework updates. Um, but in, in all of this, uh, one of the key um, facets is that your suggestions are completely welcome. This is meant to be a community event where we get together at a regular cadence um, to see how things are going and understand how we can advance Flower um, forward. So please give us suggestions and we can uh, revise how we run these monthly meetings uh, based on those things. I'd also point out that um, we uh, have at the facility for live discussions. So if you go into the Flower Slack um, workspace, there's a special channel there just for um, Flower monthly um, discussions while this event is going or in between events, people can uh, propose um, items and, and so forth. So after that reminder about you know why we're here and, and, and what the type of thing you'll see uh, generally, let's move on to the agenda for today. So the agenda for today is, is as I mentioned before, it is jam-packed. Um, we are going to uh, have a reminder about the uh, Flower Summit. Uh, we're then going to have a presentation by Adam, one of the core Flower members. He's gonna tell us about a brand new baseline that's been uh, hotly demanded by our users that we're happy to um, have implemented now. And he's also going to briefly touch upon um, the ability of tuning FL simulations and then observing what is the sort of resource requirements of those simulations. And so basically in the most of simulations, having them run nice and efficiently. And then we're gonna drop into a series of three uh, invited uh, speakers. Uh, each of these speakers are gonna talk on, on different interrelated topics. We'll be beginning with um, the uh, a demo and announcement of the um, iOS SDK. That's been an external project um, advanced by Maximilian Kapsecker at the Technical University of Munich. He's gonna um, tell us all about it. It's, a, it's really, an important advance for Flower. So now that you can have a nice clean SDK to build um, Flower clients on within the iOS um, ecosystem, so that's fantastic. We're then going to move on to hear from uh, Shinshi Chu. She is a PhD student in the University of Cambridge. She's going to tell us about how she and, and the people in her group have been um, using Flower to perform um, vertical federated learning. And so this is a, a more complex form of federated learning that aligns very well to very real um, world use cases and in particular she'll be telling us about uh, her experiences on using flower and vertical federated learning in the context of financial data and then finally we have uh, Pedro Pedro um, Guzmao also from the University of Cambridge he's going to be telling us about um, an exciting type of um, high performance simulation that he and, and others there have built on top of flower that um, shows uh, how you can use Flower to have really fast uh, simulations. And he has some really interesting um, ideas there on how you can accelerate and get the most out of the underlying hardware during simulations. And so we're going to hear from him and, and see how it all works. Um, so with that, um, let's proceed. Uh, the first topic I wanted to discuss was the Flower Summit. It is, uh, it's coming up rather fast. In about uh, two months time, we're going to have our next installment of the annual Flower Summit. Um, this is a, a sort of reminder to the community because we've announced it a couple of times now, um, but we really want you to hold the date. Um, it is going to be on May 30th and 31st. 
it's uh, um, the third installment of our annual summit. So in some sense, you could think of it like uh, as, a, as a giant flower monthly. We're going to invite, we're going to invite um, all the whole community to come join us either physically in Cambridge, UK, or join us uh, online. Uh, it'll be a hybrid event. So participation in both forms is really well, um, warmly um, invited. And then at the event itself, we're going to have two days. Uh, flower, the Flower Summit series of annual events have been growing uh, rapidly. We saw um, many multiples of, of registrations uh, um, last, last time around. And for that reason, coupled with the increased use of industry of flower, we've decided to migrate Flower Summit um, from a one-day event to a two-day event. So there's going to be a specific day um, targeting research and a particular day targeting more industrial use cases. Um, we're going to be starting a little bit later in the day, around 1.30, and ending, ending in the evenings. And that's going to be uh, uh, done so that there is more accessibility for um, those in different time zones who might be dialing in. Um, we've had a call out for, uh, for speakers uh, for a few months now, and we've got some fantastic speakers lined up. Uh, that we're going to make an announcement uh, shortly, probably with a blog post and, and social media telling you, telling you about the first batch of people who are going to come um, speak at the event. But we've got a strong mixture of, of scientists who are building on top of flower, looking at how they can push federated learning forward, um, as well as people from industry who have um, developed and, and, um, and built some really fascinating proof of concepts of using federated learning based on the, the flower uh, system. We would highly recommend uh, in particular, if you want to attend physically, to register early because there will be um, a limited number of spaces for folks. Um, so please do that if you're interested. What you're going to see is a mixture of tutorials, announcements about flower itself and how you can use it better, a roadmap about where flower is going, industrial cases, research results, and 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 just as we as I mentioned before before about flower monthly. When it comes to the Flower Summit, this is also an essential part of um, um, community building. And so we'll be listening to folks to see where they want to see the, the, the platform move next, um, what features they think are important, what things they are thinking of building out themselves and how we can support them. Um, so please do come in and so you can engage fully um, with the community. Uh, the physical location will be in the computer lab. So that's the computer science department in the University of Cambridge. They go there. We're very grateful for them to host the event. Um, and if you need to see any further details, please go to this URL uh, that you see on the screen or visit the, the uh, website. Um, so again, please save the date, uh, May 30th and 31st, for um, our next installment of our annual event, Flower Summit 2023. So now I'm really delighted to hand over to Adam. Adam's been doing fantastic work in building out a, a new important flower baseline. He's going to tell you all about it and also um, give you some pointers about how you can look at the resource um, overheads when you're doing uh, simulations. So with that, I will we'll hand over to Adam. Hello. Just a quick recap. Flower baselines are, uh, in simple words, just implementation of very popular papers uh, in federated learning and we provide an uh, easy solutions to reproduce them and um, yeah that that's that's flower baselines in a nutshell and today we are going uh, I'm going to tell you about a feminist baseline which comes from the leaf paper and um, we uh, used federated averaging strategy which was also used in the paper and uh, in order to talk about all of that, I would uh, like to firstly tell you a, a little bit uh, uh, about the history of the data set and how it was created, how it compares to very popular MNIST data, database data set. And we have a feminist data set, which was created and initially from, from the fir very first uh, huge data set, which is called uh, NIST Special Database 19. Um, and it had, uh, it still has over uh, 800,000 images of uh, handwritten digits and also uh, 
lowercase and uppercase letters. Um, the shape of each of the uh, sample is 128 by 128, and um, the images are uh, black and white. It's uh, they're not uh, grayscale images, and um, as you can see on the left side on the screen. Um, um, there were um, the data was collected using uh, handwriting sample forms, as you see, and um, there were over 3,500 uh, different writers uh, that the data was collected from, uh, which constituted uh, uh, the census office uh, employees and um, some uh, students from uh, school. And uh, also, initially, uh, the recommendation was to uh, use the uh, part of the data set that was created uh, from the students as the uh, test set and uh, the, diff the, the rest as the train set. And um, let's move to the next slide so we can see the distribution of the uh, characters uh, um, presented in uh, in the, the data set. And uh, as you can see on the left side from the, digit, the, the digits uh, still constitute a huge part of the data set. Um, and uh, the next important thing to notice is that, um, of course, the distribution is not uniform. Uh, we have um, various counts um, for different um, different uh, letters and um, yes uh, also what I'm displaying right, right now what you see right now is the uh, case when we have 62 classes meaning um, uh, 26 uh, letters uh, multiplied by two for the upper lower case plus digits however there are uh, also the uh, the version that merged uh, some of the uh, letters because, uh, for example, O, uh, lowercase and uppercase O can be, it's hard to distinguish also when we don't see it in a con in the context of a line, for example. So that's why uh, authors also decided to create a, a different version of the data set that has a different number of classes uh, based on uh, um, where the classes were merged based on the upper and lower class, uh, lowercase uh, similarities. Um, and um, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, no, actually, we can move one slide, by, uh, one slide back. Um, and uh, so uh, when we have uh, such a data set, um, then um, in MNIST data set, uh, we have 70,000 samples, uh, which were actually uh, you, um, used um, from, which were created from the NIST data set. And um, it was a mix of the uh, data from students and uh, census employees. Um, and uh, what's important to note is that um, the size of the images uh, differ, which is 28 by 28, and also uh, by various uh, pre-processing steps, uh, we have um, the images are in um, are on grayscale, meaning they don't have just single binary black white. Uh, values, but they have one wider range of uh, values. Coming back to the feminist and maybe also a uh, uh, word about amnist, uh, because of the popularity of the amnist data set, um, people decided to uh, that it would be really nice to have really the extended version of, of MNIST, uh, which uh, constitute of uh, constitutes of uh, all the samples um, presented uh, available in the uh, NIST special database. 
and uh, that's that's actually uh, MNIST. Uh, it's it stands for extended MNIST, and it has all of the samples that were uh, available in the NIST special database. And now the only part that and uh, yeah, uh, finally getting to the feminist, which uh, we are interested in, is uh, we have to have a way to uh, divide the data set such that it resembles uh, federated settings. By that, I mean that um, each client has only the data set that uh, was produced by a single person, meaning uh, yeah, written. And um, we see that um, the division of, um, of the data set, uh, which is not that trivial, but we won't go into the details about that, um, has also vary, varying, uh, si varies in size. And we see that um, the vast majority or not the vast majority, but a huge peak between 100 and 200 samples, and also some, uh, some, some, some clients uh, between 300, 400 that also also constitute a lot of have a lot of um, constitute a huge part of the data set. And uh, yes, when we have such 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 data set, we um, when we know uh, how the data set was created uh, we can move now to the next slide and uh, talk more about the implementation and the the the, the uh, experiments themselves themselves um, the model used uh, for the um, experiment was quite simple convolutional neural network which has uh, Two convolutional layers uh, followed by um, max pooling and uh, a dense layer at the end. Um, uh, yes, that that network enables us to train such model, and uh, we can see the learning curves. Actually, not the learning curves, but the accuracy in the next slide. Um, how uh, how the training uh, oh, from from the training and uh, test um, and uh, here we have the version that was directly proposed in the paper. However, we had some uh, maybe not troubles, but uh, some decisions were not that clear. Uh, therefore, we also propose an alternative uh, set of parameters uh, that we used. Uh, I mean, we used also this set, but um, um, yes, that um, we have the it visualized on the next slide. Can we move to the next slide? Yes, and. Uh, the difference between two sets is, uh, or maybe first of all, we just use uh, a subset of the full uh, feminist uh, data set, uh, which is just 5%, uh, as, you, as it was um, done in the leaf paper. And the difference between the first and the second plot, which we can see on the next slide, that the version that we proposed converges uh, way faster. And um, we also see that we were not able to, to uh, narrow the gap between the training and uh, accuracy on the train set and the test set. And um, the difference in parameters is the proposed version of the federated averaging uh, in the paper was uh, the length of such uh, training for each local client was just for five batches, meaning just five batches uh, for a single client. And we just flipped it slightly such that uh, the length is five epochs and uh, the division of the train and test uh, set are quite uh, different. It's 60%, 20%, 20% uh, training validation test uh, in the paper originally, and we used 
just 90%, 10% training test uh, that you can see the results on the platform. Um, and um, I think that's all regarding the uh, feminist baseline. Uh, there were also some other experiments and of course uh, also other data sets uh, that we uh, haven't covered, but um, feel free, maybe we'll cover them in the future and feel free uh, if you want to uh, also to contribute. And now we can move to the... Uh... Just, just before you move on to the next um, topic, I just wanted to just uh, sort of just ask a couple of questions. So just to, just to summarize, now inside Flower Baselines, people can go to that part of the repository and they can find uh, everything they need to perform uh, feminist experiments. That's uh, one big takeaway, right? Yeah, that, that, that was important to, to stay, yes. Great, okay. great. And then you mentioned that they'll, they'll find other experiments from the original leaf paper there that they can, the code is there that they can execute if they desire. Yeah, I mean, there is no, there are certain part of the code that enables to, do many the required training for the remaining experiments for the <clears throat> for the leaf data for the feminist data set. However, there are some additional uh, computation of uh, flops and um, uh, some some uh, something also that I forgot. Okay, perfect, perfect. That's, that's a great contribution. We've heard from many people who need the feminist um, baseline, and so it's great that we have that now uh, there for people to use. And I do believe also you almost you you, you nearly finished a, a blog post that we'll post in the next uh, probably week or so that will summarize much of this information too. So that's that's fantastic. Um, just wanted to make sure we kind of like uh, had a the capstone on that particular topic. Um, great, great. Thanks so much, Adam. This is great. Yes, now we can move to uh, resources monitoring and uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, uh, I'll just quickly mention um, the core ideas behind, behind monitoring uh, simulation in Flower. And for all of the people that don't know what simulation is, it just uh, enables to run experiments uh, in a very easy way. Uh, that resemble federated and federating settings. And um, there is a blog post uh, which uh, in which you can find all the details that I'll uh, mention. There are two major uh, software packages that we uh, used uh, to enable the uh, simulation monitoring, which is Prometheus and uh, Grafana. Prometheus is used for data collection and Grafana for data visualization. They can be installed uh, quite easily, especially for Mac users uh, using the Homebrew uh, package. The results of starting simulation and how to start it will be on the lay on uh, in a few slides. Uh, the results you can get is uh, you can uh, have the visualization of the many resources like CPU, GPU, memory, um, and it can be visual, it can be seen on the Ray dashboard, uh, which is available only during the runtime. And also uh, on the Grafana, which you can see uh, also after uh, you're done with your experiments. I think we can move to the how to start such simulation. What we need is uh, one argument, uh, one additional arg argument to the array init arguments in the start simulation, which is just include dashboard. We have to mention that explicitly that we uh, need it. And um, also um, uh, what you see on the slide is that you, um, can specify the number of uh, CPUs and GPUs in total, uh, as well as uh, for each of the client. What is important is, uh, the, the important thing is that um, the array doesn't itself uh, know how much, re uh, 
it doesn't, it's not necessary for Ray to know how much resources you're going to use. Uh, it will be the computation and the order of, of it will be based strictly on the values that you provide. So for example, you can say that you have a single CPU and that you um, give each client one, one CPU and it will, um, in and such settings will result in a, a consecutive uh, run of, of the client. So there will be no uh, parallelism uh, in that case. And uh, based on based on the results that you can uh, see on the Grafana, for example, you can adjust the values here, especially for the for the client resources, uh, such that uh, it meets your uh, hardware um, uh, that, that you can uh, efficiently allocate it uh, based on uh, your hardware uh, capabilities. And I think that will be all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. I, I love those two really important pieces um, for the community. And so it's great that you shared that with us um, today. Also, I think you're um, always doing so much work uh, answering questions on Slack and contributing pieces of code and so on. So I think it's a great um, opportunity also for people to get to know you. So um, it's great. Um, if you have any questions, feel, uh, feel free to ask them on Slack. Okay, great, great. So thank you again, Adam. We're yeah. going to move on to our first um, external contributor talk uh, of uh, this Flower Monthly. I'm uh, really delighted uh, to say that we have finally got excellent iOS support in um, Flower. And what's also really uh, amazing about this is that this is an external project. Um, so Maximilian and... Um, a few other people there at the Technical Un uh, University of Munich uh, wanted to see this happen. I know they've been working a lot with another core member of Flower, Charles, who you've seen in other Flower monthlies. Um, and then these folks have just run ahead with this project. And um, I'm amazed at how far and how, how great this is. So um, so thank you, Maximilian, for your contribution to Flower. And it's great to, great to chat to you today. Now this should be my presentation, hopefully in good resolution, something. It looks great. I love the okay. color. So thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to to stay in a corporate identity with, with the flower team. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, once again, uh, thank you, Nick, for the introduction, uh, and welcome everyone to this presentation on uh, FlyOS. That is federated learning meets iOS or uh, flower meets iOS. Uh, my name is Max, and I'm thrilled to introduce uh, a Swift SDK that brings the power and benefits of federated learning to the iOS world. Um, as machine learning and privacy become simultaneously more important in our world, it's relevant that developers can conveniently and easily take advantage of federated learning on iOS devices. So during this session, we'll dive into some of the details of the recently merged pull request, and we'll also provide you with uh, a sample to demonstrate how easy it is to get started and to verify also our implementation. So uh, let's start with some motivation for extending Flower towards uh, the Swift SDK. So uh, Swift is the core programming language of iOS. This makes it a critical language for developers looking to create mobile applications for iOS devices. According to a study by Statista, iOS has a coverage of 27.7%, making it the second largest mobile operating system after Android, um, which, by the way, has a, a coverage in the population of approximately 70%. Another reason for us to extend Flower towards uh, the Swift SDK is the availability of HealthKit. HealthKit is a framework provided by Apple uh, that allows developers to access and share health-related data between different applications. Uh, with HealthKit, uh, developers can access a rich source of health-related data that can be used to develop innovative healthcare applications, and it can be the foundation for several interesting machine learning use cases. Lastly, CoreML, Apple's on-device machine learning library, is a powerful tool that enables on-device optimization routines in an efficient manner as it runs natively on Apple's hardware. This means that developers can build machine learning models that run directly on iOS devices, resulting in uh, rather fast and efficient predictions. This is a critical tool for developers looking to build sophisticated applications that rely on uh, yeah, um, 
convenient uh, machine learning uh, for the uh, Apple ecosystem. So let's have a look at the architecture of the SDK. And um, for that, we like to give you the top level design of a software system that utilizes the uh, Flora Swift SDK. Uh, the software follows a server client architecture. This means that the client application will communicate with a server in order to execute its task. The client application include, includes the Flower Swift SDK as a package. This package consists of two subsystems, communication and machine learning. The machine learning subsystem provides core ML routines, which include data preparation, fitting, and evaluating the on-device machine learning model. With this subsystem, developers can integrate machine learning models directly into their iOS application, given some restrictions that we detail later. The SDK provides, furthermore, the serialization and deserialization of data structures between these two subsystems. This includes transforming uh, uh, formats such as protobuf, numpy, and Swift arrays, allowing for data exchange, exchange between the systems. The communication subsystem enables client-server communication via gRPC, allowing the server to send instructions to the client and enabling the client to respond with the respective answers. As a naming convention, um, and by the way, this follows the given flower implementation, all data structs uh, that include instructions are denoted with an ins at the end, while all responses are denoted with an res at the end. So that's why those three beginning letters are written in bold. Considering a high-level representation of the information flow, the, info the communication for the core process looks like this, and this might be already familiar to you, but um, sorry for um, repeating it, maybe. Um, so uh, the server initiates a communication by sending a get parameters ins request to the client. It requests the client to return the current model parameters, which are returned in the get parameters rest structure. In the current implementation, the server does this to capture an initial version of the model's weights, but note that this uh, it, it is usually not uncommon for the server to initiate the model's weights on its own. Once the minimum number of required devices is reached, the server sends the fit ins message. It instructs the participating clients to inject the global model, model parameters attached to the fit ins message and start the local optimization. The server, in turn, expects the fitted model parameter fit res as the result. After the model has been locally optimized and the server has, has received this result, the evaluate ins message requests client to inject a test set and return the resulting evalu evaluate res structure, which contains information such as loss or accuracy. On behalf of the server, a reconnect ins command can be sent to request the client to reconnect to the server or on the client side, on the other hand, the communication can be terminated at any given time. So let's assume you're building an iOS application of version 14 and higher, and you've already managed to integrate the Flower SDK to your Xcode project. How can you use it in your implementation? Therefore, we'll have a look at the following code snippet. First, at the top of your file is the import of the Flower package. Then you can write custom code such as code maps, such as code that maps the domain logic, loads data, or defines the machine learning model. If you want to instantiate the um, ML Flower client, which is connected to the machine learning subsystem, you need three variables. The variable layer wrapper from the ML layer wrapper class contains a reference to the structure of the model and the associated weights. The second variable, data loader of type uh, ML data loader, stores the information about train and test batches. Batches have the great advantage of optimizing performance, for instance, in case of asynchronous data loading or memory intensive da uh, data loading. Finally, uh, the uh, compiled model URL, uh, so the, the last argument here um, of type URL, points to the path of the compiled machine learning model in the uh, file system of your Xcode project. The second required instance is of type Flower gRPC. It instantiates the class that enables communication between the client and the server. Therefore, it takes the host name and port of the server as arguments. As a final implementation step, you need to start the connection by passing the ML Flower client. 
Note that you also need to provide a completion handler that is the behavior upon completion of the federated learning process. Here, for instance, we um, just said, okay, once the process is finished, um, uh, log.info, so just a uh, logging shall happen to the console. However, the implementation only provides a standard machine learning client. More specifically, that means the ML Flower client is limited to dense and convolutional layers only by now and supports only the core ML as a framework. But for special needs, such as using TensorFlow Lite, you can write your own ML client by implementing the SDK's abstract client protocol. It requires the implementation of four predefined function bodies. These are a function that returns the parameters of the model, a function that returns the properties of the model, a function that applies the fitting command and return the respective results, and a function that does the same for the evaluate model task. Okay, um, what does this look like in practice? For this purpose, we have included the SDK in an IOS benchmark application. Um, you can find the example at the link provided on the slide here uh, on the bottom. It contains uh, the um, well-known MNIST benchmark scenario that we will now present uh, in a demonstration. And I hope uh, this runs smoothly um, because we've never tested it before um, with the frames per seconds and so on. What we have here uh, on the left-hand side is actually um, just um, a terminal where I can start the server and um, lock the, the server output. And then I have here three iPhone 13 Pros. So we have some uh, iPhones at our um, university. So that was also kind of the reason we were going for um, the um, iOS uh, ecosystem. And um, so maybe I start with um, yeah, starting the server. And um, what I um, hand over is the minimum number of required clients is free, and we want to run um, each round or in, in, uh, all together, we want to run it for three rounds. So th these are the arguments I'm um, handing over to the server by now. And um, with that, I'm starting it. So take some time, maybe it's already running for a while. The terminal, ah, no, no, now it started. And um, no, now I'm switching over to um, the my, my client application. So within this uh, benchmark iOS application, we included the SDK and, and it works perfectly fine in, in the back end. And what I'm doing first, um, so as I said, um, we're running the MNIST benchmark scenario, but we're not loading 60K images, which would be the usual size of the train data set, um, but we limited it to uh, 10,000 um, images. So it doesn't make a huge difference in timing, but for the sake of the demonstration, um, waiting for like a minute would be kind of awkward silence. So for that reason, we restricted it to 10,000 images. So I'm pressing here on, and by the way, what I'm doing now would usually be done in the background of an application, but um, for demonstration purposes, we're doing that step by step. So first of all, we want to prepare our data set. So that means, uh, the app uh, loads from a CSV file um, in the back end, the um, 10,000 um, uh, images, the 28 by 28 grayscale um, images. And um, so we do with the test data set. So now uh, all of them uh, are loaded. Um, I could also prepare a local client. So the um, idea behind the local client is just if I want to test without any federated learning, um, how um, machine learning behaves on an iOS um, device. I can test it here, for instance, um, setting it uh, the, 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 the epochs to two and uh, running the training. As you see, it, it's, it's, it runs quite fast and um, I also can um, do inference on the test set and receive um, the respective um, loss for that. Um, but more interestingly, uh, here below, um, we can prepare our federated uh, client. So at the time I click at start here, um, the code snippet I just have shown to you is executed. Um, furthermore, what I have to um, provide is the server host name. So um, we made a secure text field out of it. So um, no one can see my IP address. and. Um, the um, server port is, is 8080, so nothing, nothing crucial here. And um, let me start. Um, I have to grant access to the network because it's a, we just installed it uh, 
So I have to uh, grant access uh, to the network. And um, the same I do for the second device. And um, usually you can see here on the left-hand side, um, nothing happens because we haven't reached three devices um, by now. At least it, nothing should happen or nothing should change. And once um, we also start for the third uh, device, um, the server starts um, also um, responding. So it says uh, it has uh, sampled three clients out of three. And um, the process, um, as you know from uh, also the, the, the Python implementation, um, starts. So, um, and now um, the, the, the information flow that I've shown uh, previously, like um, sending out the fit um, ins uh, message and re receiving the fit res uh, message, um, that is now started um, for three rounds. So um, we have to wait for that. Ah, now it has finished. Um, it returns here um, for the different devices, also the losses, so they're quite low. Um, so might be that the network is, is quite large for 10,000 images and therefore we tend to also have kind of an overfitting, but um, accuracy shall not be the, the, the main topic here, but just for um, demonstrating you that it works. Um, this was um, our uh, demonstration on that. Um, what you also can do um, within this application, and um, so did we um, with um, at least uh, 16 iOS devices lately, we run some performance analysis, which we also want to uh, publish in an art article, uh, which further demonstrates um, how, how well this works. But um, if you're interested in um, how much battery consumption is behind that, um, what was uh, the network traffic uh, and what was the accuracy, you have here uh, on the uh, very bottom um, a benchmark tab where you can yeah. actually import um, those metric metrics and, and share it, um, for instance, um, with your um, with your computer, it's in JSON format, so you can do analysis on it. Um, if you are interested more into that and what you can analyze with it, um, I'm happy to to answer your questions uh, later on on that. So, um, what what is our uh, conclusion? Um, as I just said, we even performed a larger performance analysis with 16 iOS devices to measure uh, the battery network communication and timing for different scenarios. Like we simulated dropping or joining of devices. Like um, we had first of all, um, we said uh, the, the the minimum threshold are 10 devices, and um, we started with 12 devices. And um, by time um, or for each epoch, we dropped some devices and. Once um, they, um, the, the minimum number of devices were, um, were not met anymore, um, the process stopped as um, um, expected. Of course, there are implementation challenges that hold some interesting tasks for the future. So um, for security reasons, iOS is quite restrictive when it comes to background threats. While there are options for scheduling tasks in the implementation, they do not address the desire to run federated learning as a full background process. Um, the SDK does not include adversarial attack prevention technology by now, such as secure aggregation or differential privacy. Um, furthermore, um, during the benchmarks experiment, we saw that older devices with lower capacity tend to lose battery power quickly. So uh, mechanisms are needed that can distribute a load of training or even exclude devices that are not powerful enough to perform on-device optimization. Um, yeah, um, there's also the possibility to extend the benchmark application with more scenarios like um, the C410 data set and to make the process more vivid on the device by showing the current incoming and outcoming, out outgoing messages. And um, yeah, personally, my plans are to include variational autoencoders into the mobile federated learning context, um, specifically as autoencoders seem to be an appropriate access for um, unsupervised federated learning. And with all the data stored in HealthKit, we have several ideas to explore here. Yeah, at this point, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Daniel and Christoph, that contributed to the project as well. Um, feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any further questions. And with this, thank you for joining today in this presentation. I hope that you have found the information presented to be helpful. And 
If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to ask on uh, Slack um, or um, drop us an email. Thank you so much. This is an amazing contribution. Um, and I really appreciate the way you presented it today too. It's it so clear that you had this um, this visual, visual um, live view of the actual phones. You're a very brave man, I must say, just running three phones. And I think I saw an iPad there all working yeah. together and, and you it was not a, a, a you know a canned um demonstration it's a real in front of us demonstration live so that's uh that was brilliant um Thank and you. i mean and furthermore i mean I, I can't wait to see what the cloud community was going to build on top of this sdk because once you can start having clients and nodes on your um on os class devices uh you know the, the world's your oyster about what you could build in terms of federated uh, learning using that platform so amazing um, thank you appreciate your words yeah, great. I'm sure people are going to engage with you on on Slack and, and, and following up uh, with you on this, this contribution. So th thank you so much today. I really appreciate it. And so um, next on this jam-packed Flower Monthly, I am going to briefly share my screen so that you can uh, see the title screen or the title slide of our next uh, speaker. Um, we are joined today by Shinji Chu. She is a PhD student in the University of Cambridge. And uh, she's been doing something completely different with Flower um, to, versus what we just heard about iOS. She's been looking at how you can uh, use Flower to tackle what is a very um, thorny but commonly occurring problem in real world situations. And that's this class of problem um, called vertical federated learning, where the um, where the format and the, where the, the data structures required to learn across are not uniform across all clients. And so um, she's been looking at this with uh, others at Cambridge on how this can apply to financial data. They've come up with some really interesting, powerful ideas on how you can use Flow to tackle these problems and had a lot of success in applying these things to um, financial type of data. And so um, I'm so happy that she can join us today to um, show us uh, what she's been up to. And um, with that, um, thank you, Shinti, for joining us. And the, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Shinti. Uh, I'm from Machine Learning System Lab from University of Cambridge. And today, I would like to talk about vertical FL using financial data. Our solution is participating in the UK-US PET Tries Challenge competition this year in January. And we have won first place. Um, so first, let me briefly talk about the challenge and the problem we are facing here. Uh, machine learning solutions are widely used in the finance sector, especially for the financial crime detection, such as the anti-money laundry or fraudulent transaction detections. But for fundamental bottleneck in applying these machine learning methods is the demand for large amount of data to be collected in one single location during the training time which can be a deal breaker for financial applications, such because the data is very sensitive, it involves a lot of the private information of each account and each transaction, and because different legal restrictions like that happen around the world, and it, which uh, can prevent the data from different institutions to be collected and stored in one place. The goal for this problem is to use federated learning for financial fraud detections for each transaction uh, using the synthetic data provided by SWIFT and different banks. Uh, however, only using the federated learning is not going to guarantee the privacy or the security of the raw or original data from different attacks from the malicious clients, as we might see from a lot of literatures that the malicious client can do different kinds of attack, rather, uh, for example, the data reconstruction attack or inference attack. Therefore, we are designing a solution with different, uh, different privacy-preserving method to mathematically mathematically guaranteeing the security of the raw data. Uh, for, federal, uh, for vertical federal learning, uh, what exactly is vertical federal learning? Uh, different from what we usually see in the literature on experiment, which is what we usually call horizontal federal learning. That means that the clients will have the same feature space, but different clients will have different sample IDs or 
or for example, like this, if we petition C5 or families like we previously see, that we petition each image in, and, and, then put, uh, and then send to different clients, but you know, each image will have the same feature space. But for the vertical FL, on the other hand, client might have different features stored in their local data set, and the label might only be stored in one particular client and not existing in all clients. So in, to explain in more details about the data set we are facing here, our data set has two, two different kinds of institutions. One is called SWIFT, which has all the transaction data with the features such as the transaction date, transaction currency, uh, the sender bank, the receiver bank, or the transaction amount, et cetera. And other kind of institutions are banks, which can uh, which can be multiple banks across the world. For the banks, each bank will have a specific information for specific accounts that they may have different indications of, about the activity of the accounts and may have the flags about the of the abnormality of the accounts, which might help in the fraud detections. And also for this particular account, uh, for this particular data set, the label only exists in the suite, which has all the transaction data set. Uh, so in terms of the model we are using, our main solution consists of the two parts. The first part involves a pre-training phase in the SWIFT because it has all the transaction information and the label. The pre-training models allow us to extract valuable information or embeddings from the raw data without directly sharing any private information with the server or other uh, or third parties such as banks. And in the second part, we use a logistic regression to train the final predictions uh, for this particular data set. And it can be easily replaced with any other neural network based model in the future. But here, because of this particular data set, we use the simple model and we use the logistic regression. Uh, and then it comes to the more important part, which, in the, which is the security part of the solutions. We utilize the concept of secure aggregation of federated learning. And it, uh, firstly, we will need a setup phase for the key exchange for all clients. We use the ECDH key agreement protocol to generate a shared secret through insecure channels between clients and the aggregator, which is the server. The shared secrets will be used to build a secure pairwise channels for symmetric encryption and facilitate the secure aggregation. During the setup phase, the central aggregator on the server will request the public key for all the participating clients and the SWIFT, and then all the banks or and the SWIFT will, will, uh, will send back their public keys and the server will broadcast their public keys to all the participating clients. Then it comes to the training phase. Uh, the first step, uh, the training phase has uh, three main steps. The first step is the mini batch selections. Uh, since Swift clients has all the information regarding each transaction and the ground truth label, the mini batch selections will start from Swift. It will then uh, first select a batch of data of which each data records will have the ordinary account, which is the sender and the beneficiary account, which is the receiver for each account uh, for each transaction. And at least will uh, cooperating in uh, these specific banks might and these two banks might be different banks. And then Swift will then upload the encrypted batch to an aggregator, which will broadcast to all the bank clients. As the account numbers are encrypted using different keys, each bank client can, can only decrypt account numbers existing in their own local data set, which prevent any other party from knowing actual information about the batch and accounts and actual information in it. And then it, it comes to the forward pass. Since the logistic regression requires all the information from the SWIFT, the sender banks and the receiver bank to compute and then to make the final predictions. Uh, in this here, we, we, uh, we follow in the idea of the secure aggregation, which is by adding the noise to each input of the logistic re regression, but we make sure like the noise we add are canceled out after the summation. So the ultimate result after the summation will be the same without any, without any noise, which guarantee the result uh, like won't be affected by adding the noise. But since we're adding the noise, that like each individual's uh, if if there's a malicious client intercept the uh, transact uh, uh, the data set transfer from the clients to the uh, server, they cannot reconstruct the original data because of the 
because of the least added noise. And then we back, uh, and then we come to the backward pass. We decide to share the label with each transaction as label is not ID identifiable. Since if you only know the labels, like it's only one or zero, you cannot reconstruct anything. So we share the labels in, for each transaction with the encryption as well. So each only the banks with this mini badge will have the label. And then we can compute the gradients in each client and also with, with the noise. And with the same idea as the secure aggregation and the forward pass, the gradients will be canceled out after the summation of the mini batch. So that the summed gradients for the mini, mini batch will not be affected by the noise. But so when, the S, when, when we do the SGD, it will be accurate. However, even with the, uh, however, even the third party on the malicious clients uh, intercept on the gradients, it will still be masked with the noise, so you cannot reconstruct any private information existing in the bank. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the advantage of our solutions mainly has four parts. The first part is because we use secure aggregation and encryption, our method protects the original data completely because of the noise we added. To reduce the risk of information leakage, we also use the uh, the first stage of the uh, first stage training in the Swift, because if we do the embedding extraction, it, it will be adding one more layers. So it will be make it even harder to reconstruct the original features. And because we use this mask uh, gradient and the mask input, it is, it is impossible to reconstruct the original data or make the inference about the sensitive information in the data set without knowing the mask or without knowing the noise. Therefore, our method protects the model from both late label, uh, data reconstruction or the membership inference attack. Our method also have the minimal degradation from the centralized solutions. As you might know, with federal learning, usually there will be a gap between centralized performance and FL performance due to the process of the Fed average or the statistical heterogeneity of each client. However, because of a solution, the forward pass and the backward pass are done per mini batch, which will be essentially the same as the centralized training. And because the mask we added and the noise we added are cancel out each other. Uh, so during the summation, the final number will not be affected by the noise, which means less optimal performance won't be impacted by adding the noise or adding these security layers. Uh, thirdly, our solution stands out from others because it offers the most uh, efficient approach to data encryption. We are not directly encrypting uh, the, imp the input to the logistic regression or directly uh, encrypt the gradients, which will be very computational and communicational expensive. Our method is is, uh, it's very efficient. And the final result are decrypted very naturally through the summations. Like I said before, it would naturally cancel out each other to get an ultimate accurate result. Uh, lastly, our method is model agnostic. For this particular data set, we use uh, SGBoost for the pre training phase and the logistic regression for the second stage. However, however these two can also be replaced with any more. Uh, other models for uh, uh, if we are uh, switching to other data sets or if we have more advanced models in the future for this particular data set, it, which can be easily to re easily replaced as well. We are also working to make our model more generalized to all different kinds of data set and to all kinds of vertical FL settings in the future to make it work for all different kinds of scenarios. Uh, many thanks everyone for listening. And here's my email address in case you have any questions. I'm also in the Flower Slack channel if you if you want to uh, contact me or if you have any questions in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sinchi. This is a um, this is a great piece of work I think from you and the, the rest of the folks involved. Uh, in particular, what I really like about this example is it um, it hammers home this point that some people have, which is they think, oh, federated learning out of the box is going to be, you know, privacy preserving. And then maybe they, they don't realize that you need to add in different types of measures. And then beyond that, they start to think, oh, well, I just have to add in differential privacy or segregation. They treat them like they're just little boxes you add into the mix. But whereas, in fact, federated learning is an opportunity to make something secure, whereby you have to think very carefully about the overall design. And I like the fact that you're using other types of primitives. You've got encryption in there you thought very carefully about which pieces of data and how sensitive are they and how are they going to interact 
at the various stages of the learning process. And so I think this is a really great blueprint of how people should think about securing a piece of federated learning, um, where you think about the task, you think about the data types, you think about a, a, a wide palette of technical solutions and then apply them as and where they are needed. So yeah, this is this is great. And then the vertical federated learning piece is really important too. We, we get asked a lot about how do you handle cases where not every client has identical um, data structures and, and the model uh, attributes of each client. And so um, this is really a great, important work. Um, so thank, thank you for today. That is a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for <clears throat> inviting me. So our final speaker is uh, Pedro Guzmao. He is also at uh, Cambridge, but he's going to be presenting a, 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 a quite a different type of contribution. And this is uh, not vertical FL, but simulated FL. Um, if you're doing a simulated FL, it's a really important step in um, the development of any FL solution. You come up with the idea, you know what you want to uh, try to federate, but at some point you need to like start looking at the parameterizations of it. What happens if I have more nodes? What happens if I have more data? How is it going to work at scale? And, and without the simulator piece of this, it's never going to happen. And if a simulator is not fast enough, you're never going to do it. And so Pedro and a bunch of folks there have come up with some really interesting ideas about how you can simulate things much more efficiently with nice high fast throughput. You can trial and error to your heart's content until you nail that solution and then you can deploy. Um, so I'm going to hand over to him. He can tell us about how they've done it, um, how they've managed to um, beat, I think, every other framework they could find, um, building on top of Flower and introducing some really powerful new ideas. Um, so over to you, Pedro. Thank you for coming today. Uh Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Um, just checking, can everyone see my, my screen? Yes, we can see the slides. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, thanks for having me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, high-performance simulation in FL. This is actually um, part of the work we, we submitted to, recently to Mobicom. And uh, obviously, it is a, a group effort with all the, the people who, who participated uh, being shown here. So I guess uh, just to start with this presentation, I think it's important to, to know what, why, why are we doing this, right? So why is FL simulation important? So it is important because it helps you understand the effect of training uh, using a large amount of data that is distributed. Uh, over many clients. It helps you test a few ideas that you have. Uh, for example, if you have a new idea around uh, a new type of aggregation strategy, uh, maybe you have an idea on how to create a model that is by nature distributed and you want to test this idea. Um, and maybe with th these ideas, uh, what you really are trying to do is to close the existing gap between centralized training and federated learning. So we know that from reading papers in, uh, in federated learning, uh, sometimes people will report uh, their results on centralized training. And this is usually uh, better performance when you compare it to federated learning. And that leads us to a kind of ultimate question that at least I want to, to answer, um, which is can data availability I mean, with all the data that you can unlock with federated learning, could we possibly beat the convenience of being able to train everything centralized? Could we actually outperform centralized learning? But obviously we want to do this within reasonable time. Our experiments, they, they should finish at least within our deadlines, right? So we want to run simulations and we want to have reliable results, but we also want these results to uh, deliver within a reasonable time. So that if you have shorter experiments and you get quicker results, you can run more experiments, try new ideas, so on and so forth. So just to give you an idea of what FL simulation is in a nutshell, well, we all know that in the regular federated scenario, you have a federated learning server that will sample clients, and these clients will train in a federated way. 
when you're doing simulation, what you do is you still sample those clients. Maybe you sample client IDs, and then you have a, um, a group of nodes of uh, processing nodes. Each of these nodes are servers uh, having multiple GPUs. And you want to allocate these clients, these virtual clients, as also uh, Flower uses, to these different nodes and hope that they will train those clients, again, in reasonable time, give you back um, their um, train model, you aggregate in your, um, in your server, and then you continue performing the round. So the simulation is very similar to the real thing, just accept that sometimes you do not have enough resources to start a single process for, uh, for each one of your possibly thousands of uh, clients that you're sampling. So what you do is you sample IDs, you send these IDs to individual nodes. These nodes might contain a concept of a worker. Um, a worker is nothing but a process that will run, will execute the training, of multiple uh, virtual clients. It can run one worker per GPU that would possibly not be very efficient. We'll see uh, why. But then you can also run multiple works on the same GPU simulating multiple clients running on the same device. Okay, so this is just an overview. Uh, you have the server, sends IDs to different nodes. The different nodes will assign these IDs to different workers. They will train, they will respond to the server. Now, if we see this process as a general machine learning workload, we might be biased towards some requirements, some, some characteristics that are actually from centralized training, centralized learning. Um, and when we look into centralized learning, we see that usually you have large and homogeneous workloads. If you think about large language models, you usually have uh, very large workloads that have to be distributed over multiple GPUs, and that the training process of running those large models of learning, uh, of training um, very heavy workloads, they probably run across uh, days, um, and even weeks, depending on the model. This is not this. This is not what happens in federated learning. When you use federated learning, you usually, again, if we think about cross device, uh, you are planning on training models on mobile phones. So a mobile phone will not have a GPU or CPU that's comparable to a powerful server with multiple uh, NVIDIA GPU. So. Uh, you're training on very small heterogeneous uh, workloads because now you're training over different clients. Each client will have different amounts of data. Um, you will have shorter training processes. Imagine now that you want what you would possibly train in a few seconds in a, in a mobile CPU. Now, if you're really training in a simulation environment and using server GPUs, that will take fraction of seconds. So the 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 workload for a single client is very, very short. And since it's very short, like we mentioned before, the concept of worker, it is possibly better to have multiple workers, multiple virtual clients running on the same GPU. This is because each client will only use a single fraction of a GPU. And here what I have are two plots that demonstrate exact that. Um, on your left, you have the distribution of mini batches over uh, the clients. So you have clients, the number of clients um, that will have a specific fraction of samples for that data set. We have here three data sets, open image, which as the name implies is made of uh, images for image recognition. You have Google speech, which is a uh, uh, keyword spotting um, data set. And you have Shakespeare, which is usually used for um, language modeling. And you, as you can see from the, the slides, um, you have peaks at different points of this distribution, meaning that you do not have a kind of constant load per client. You would like to have one peak on only one position of these uh, for each one of these distributions. That means that 
each client would have the same amount of workload. And that's really easy to work with. On the bottom of the right, what you have is the training time distribution of these clients over heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous hardware. So in a real scenario, in a real uh, research scenario, what you do have is you have nodes, but not necessarily they have the same GPUs. So if you do assign similar clients to different GPUs, they will train in different, uh, at different speeds. Okay? And it will end up that you will probably have one GPU that's idle whilst another one's still working just because it's slightly um, slower. And that is actually the regular way that um, federated learning frameworks in general work. They use what is called a naive code-based approach to client sampling. So in this kind of approach, in this uh, pool-based approach, you have the server that, again, samples uh, clients, but then it creates a queue of clients where each node will sample a client and perform its training locally. And once it's, once it's done, it will sample another client from this queue, one at a time. So as soon as it's done, it will sample another one and train again. Okay, this kind of sounds um, efficient, but unfortunately it's actually not. So um, the issues with this are that fetching new clients every time you finish one will uh, incur into more communication server node per round. Uh, GPUs by doing this way will probably not be fully utilized. So you have uh, GPUs with a lot of free memory, especially when they're done with one client and still waiting for the communication. And also by allowing GPUs and workers and nodes to each one uh, sample from this queue, you basically are allowing hardware to be treated equally. And that's not good, again, because you can end up sampling a very large client uh, to a worker that is not very fast. And this, in the end, will hold up your, your round. You will hold up the, the end of your round by submitting uh, the training model. You still have some GPUs that are just idle. Another approach, and this is the approach that we take in, uh, in our submission, is this push-based approach, where the server will predefine which clients will run where. And in addition, it will allow also the nodes to perform a kind of partial aggregation, meaning that if your aggregation strategy, uh, like feather, federated averaging, uh, allows you for um, associative um, property, then you can actually pre-accumulate, pre-aggregate the, the partial results from your workers before you send this back to, to the server. So this is the approach that we do that we take in, in, our, uh, in our paper. But again, the question is now, how do we associate clients with hardware? How do we uh, choose where to send what? And I think every time we have something like to, to remember, it's good to have a meme. So what we really want at the end of the day is to have balanced workloads across heterogeneous uh, hardware so that all, works, all workers will finish simultaneously. So if they all finish simultaneously, so no one's idle, you're done, you can submit your uh, partial, partial aggregated models and you can start a new round. And how do we do it? Well, eventually I will show you, but it's by using client placement based on the training time. So we will eventually evaluate the training time that each client takes. And then based on this, uh, uh, place this client onto the, um, the right piece of hardware. Uh, here's the, the implementation that we, we do. We call it pollen, kind of related with flower. Uh, and obviously we use flower because um, we all know how to use it. It's very easy to use, it's very easy to modify. So we simply create new models uh, that can be easily integrated with the framework. And the main ones that we do, we created here are the resource allocator, the placement strategy, 
and the partial aggregation. We also create a new kind of client that we ca call it now worker that is able to take a list of virtual clients and process each one of those. But again, this is almost trivial with Flower. So going to the resource allocator, as I said, it is important for, uh, for this process for us to know what kind of hardware we have, especially when we have different kind of hardware. So we do have this concept of resource allocation, allocator and a node resource um, module that will communicate and um, will communicate the number of CPU cores, uh, the number of GPUs that are available in each node to the server so that the server can make a decision on uh, which hardware is faster, which hardware is, is slower, so on and so forth. With this information, we use the concept of uh, placement strategy. And this placement strategy, what it does is it will associate, based on the information that we received from uh, the resource allocation, it will associate uh, a specific client with specific characteristics, for example, the data set size, onto a specific worker. Okay. Again, the whole goal here is to have balanced work, uh, workloads so that everyone finish at the same time uh, and you don't have um, idle hardware. And you can see from this, um, this um, slide is that we still have the list of uh, clients that we want to train, but then we make this decision and send a subset of this list to different workers. Okay, so here we have three workers in this example. And finally, to make things even, even faster, we perform partial aggregation inside the worker and inside the node before we can uh, set it back to, to, to the Flower server. Now, we studied different kinds of placement strategies. I briefly mentioned the one based on time, but we also compared to different kinds of uh, placement strategies. Here we have the naive um, random, random robin, which is very basic. What you do is you, you have that original list, and then you keep sending them across all your possible devices. Then you have a better version of this, which is the sorted uh, round robin, where you first um, sort this list based on the number of mini batches that you have to train. So a client with a larger data set, uh, the two uh, first clients with the largest data set will be close together and they will be sent to different pieces of hardware, okay, different GPUs. So that you're on, already trying to balance it, uh, this training based on the data set. Then you have uh, this batch uniform where clients are sequentially assigned to workload, having um, the least amount of batches. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. the previous one sorted, and uh, this, uh, this one, amount of batches, yes. And finally, you have the, uh, we ha you have the model, the, our proposed model, which is pollen. And pollen is based on calculating how much time, estimating how much time that specific client would take in each one of these um, of these uh, GPUs of these workers, and then assigning it to the worker where the accumulated training time would be the least. So you keep filling this kind of histogram of training times based on okay, in this it, uh, this fast uh, GPU, it will only take five seconds. This lower one, it will take. 10 seconds, but this one is actually the current training time, total current training time is very low. So we will associate this with the slower GPU, but next time we'll probably be the faster GPU. So th there's a, um, we, we are always trying to maintain a, a finishing time equal amongst all the GPUs, all the, the workers. And the way we model this, well, there are basically two ways if you think about it. Well, well, basically one way, but then we take another step, uh, uh, a better step um, from this uh, model. The basic one is that you will model the training time of a single virtual client as a linear function of its uh, of the number of mini batches that it has. 
not a number of data samples, but many batches. This is because, again, we're using GPUs. Uh, we work in parallel. So what actually counts is the number of mini batches. We've noticed that this kind of works, but we, we were able to improve on this model. So we actually uh, increment this by adding a, a logarithm um, um, part in this, uh, in this equation, um, which as you can see, gives us a slightly better um, uh, mean square error when we try to fit the curves based on what we, we accumulate. And this is what we call in the pollen learn based method. And what you see here in this slide is how well this, um, this strategy does when we compare the delays between two workers. So what we are trying to see here is the, the minimum delta between the, the best and the second best workers. Uh, again, we have the three uh, data sets that we, we saw. We noticed that the Shakespeare one, all of these um, all of these methods, they kind of behave the same, but this is because Shakespeare requires very few clients per round. It's a data set, it's a, a, um, a benchmark defined by a paper called Leaf. And you do have very few um, clients per round and it just ends up that you have one client per worker. We'll get back to this uh, very important point. You end up having just one client per worker, so it doesn't really matter that much uh, because you have one in each queue. Anyways, uh, you do have then um, Google Speech. And in Google Speech, you can see that the delta is better than uh, even random robin. This has to do also uh, with the distribution of the data across clients. Again, so if you have uh, kind of kernels of concentrations of clients having very different um, uh, number of data samples, that is your worst case scenario. So in Google Speech, this doesn't happen much, but when you look at open image, uh, that's when you start seeing um, this delta between best and and second best in uh, the learn based pollen going down. And here, when we compare flower plus pollen against two of the main um, mostly used uh, other than flower um, frameworks, meaning fat scale and flute, here's where you can see our, the throughput that flower plus pollen can give you in these three data sets. So you can see here that if you use flower plus pollen, you can have an up to uh, three to five times increase in the throughput. So your experiment will be faster three to five times just by using a kind of smart way to assign virtual clients to different hardware. So this kind of shows why we need this, this time prediction and why we have to move away from that um, pull-based uh, pull um, approach. But I did mention something about Shakespeare before, the fact that you would have only one, um, one client per worker. So we noticed that this learn-based approach really works very well when in, in real research scenarios, real simulation scenarios, which is exactly when you have a fixed setup of hardware, you have those nodes, you have those GPUs, and you want to increase the number of clients per round to a realistic large scale scenario. That means that each worker will have a high density of clients in the end. So you won't, ha you won't have just one client per worker. That's not even realistic. You will have hundreds, thousands of clients in that queue. So if you can manage and create queues that are appropriate for each client, and you keep in mind that you want all of them to, to finish more or less at the same time, then you have a probably a large concentration of clients per worker. And this is what you have 
in this part of the graph when you have fewer GPUs, but you keep constant the, the number of clients that are being uh, used on those GPUs. So if your total number of GPUs is two, that's where you really see a great throughput um, on this learned based uh, by Pollen. As you dilute this, as you buy more hardware, but you keep the same number of clients, uh, you start saying that, okay, it won't matter so much. But again, this is not very realistic. You're probably not just going to buy double, triple the amount of GPUs that you have just because you want to, well, it's not realistic from a money perspective, uh, just because you want to multiply by 10, 100, 1,000, the number of uh, participating um, clients per round. So final takeaway, federated uh, learning workloads have unique requirements. Correct placement can reduce the training times, and they will. Um, client density matters, and we see more benefits as we increase this density of clients per round divided by the number of GPUs. Uh, and this is all I have for today. Okay. Yeah. And I'm open for questions if there are any. Thank you so much for uh, staying this long. Thank you, Pedro. Um, that, that is bang on time. Um, but as a consequence, we probably won't collect any questions. People can co connect with you over Slack or you've got your email address there. Um, I really love this work because what I think is really powerful about it is it, it's one of these uh, situations where you look at a problem, you sort of reason from first principles to some degree, you think about what are the key drivers of the issue you want to optimize, and then you develop a system around that. Um, and so this is, it's a great piece of science. Um, thank you for sharing with us today. And, and it also nails down, at least, well, at least it advances forward appreciably, I believe, a key part of the sort of like ecosystem of tools that we need for developing these buried systems. Clearly, you need to simulate before you deploy. Definitely. And so then, uh, and if the simulation is too long, um, it's never going, it's going to slow down development and everything because you know, machine learning is such an experimental science. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. It looks like those um, those gaps there are, are sort of pretty meaningful. So that's, that's yeah. really great to see. Um, thank you. Great. Well, that draws us to the end of this uh, Flower Monthly for April. I'll just reshare my screen again. And we can see the final slide. And the final slide, of course, is um, to say, first of all, thank you to all our great uh, speakers today. <clears throat> you notice this with a supersized Flower Monthly today. We had um, a presentation earlier on from Adam, a core member of the team that you would have seen in Slack and other posts and definitely in the code uh, a lot. So it was great to see Adam here and kind of connect with him further. And he presented um, feminist and the and evaluation methodologies for when you're doing simulation in terms of the resources they're using. Um, we then had a, a wonderful contribution um, from Maximilian, uh, who showed us he and his his group had developed um, this this uh, SDK for taking Flower to iOS devices. And so I can I can really imagine uh, many of our users out there really building on top of that again to seeing what sort of interesting applications they can have running on iOS devices of various kinds for doing federated learning. So that was amazing. We then had uh, Shinchi. She showed us how you can um, improve and perform um, vertical federated learning, in particular when you have fairly exacting requirements for the security and privacy. And then finally, we just heard from Pedro giving a really powerful, clear, talk about uh, what are the design principles you need to incorporate for high performance simulation, uh, looking at an implementation of those ideas, and then proving out that the observations, the empirical observations of how you can accelerate these things uh, do manifest in practice. And they, and they did these experiments all in flower. And I think in time, we can see some of these capabilities um, flow through into to the general usage. Um, so thank you to all those folks for um, presenting their, their, their work and sharing it with us all. It's wonderful. Um, the only last thing I need to say is uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again, uh, again in um, May the 3rd. That'll be the first Wednesday of next month. Uh, we're going to run it at 5 p.m. GMT, and we'll be converting that into the various uh, time zones 
around the world for you. So you can also sort of see how that maps to your local um, time zone. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing you all then. And, um, and one final thing, uh, do keep in the back of your mind if you are interested in attending the Flowers Summit, especially in person, consider registering uh, early before we run out of slots. Um, and, and finally, we would love to hear um, from you if you want to uh, present something. So do uh, submit uh, a talk proposal. Um, we've started going through them already and started to accepting um, those that are very strong. And so don't be shy. Let us know what you want to talk about. We'll see it how, how it will fit inside the program. And um, But do also definitely attend if you can, either physically or virtually, um, because we'd love to see you. So again, that's it. Thank you for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care, everyone.